Right. So uh, coming to to the second slide. So as we know that the COVID nineteen is a global pandemic and it started with a uh, uh, one. It was emerged in the Wuhan city in China and then it has spread all over the world and it has uh, both what you call as a psychologically, economically, everything it has destroyed. So whole world is now facing a global crisis because of the COVID-19. And not only one, this, so down the line, this 21st era, this 2020 or 21st century is going to be the era of infectious diseases because not only COVID, there are a lot of other infectious diseases like if you see Hanta, Lhasa, okay, uh, this type of viruses are emerging and which, which will be posing a challenge to human health. So since the COVID-19 has a given a lesson, and if you see there are total more than 700,000 cases worldwide and more than 4 lakh deaths has happened. And in India, the infection is, is rising and every day there is exponential increase. And if you do to it, if you if you people are following newspapers and new channels, today's uh, the status is like we have more than 25, uh, 2.5 lakhs cases, active cases, and more than 7,000 deaths. So this is a really alarming situation because we can say that, okay, in flu also we have our deaths like, but uh, if you see the deaths compared to flu is almost more than tenfold because in flu roughly we have a 0.2% death but in this case, it ranged from 0.7 to 0.3 percent death. So it's a very alarming situation, and we have to have some sort of therapies. And I think uh, that's how today my focus of my talk talk is to give you uh, what various approaches are being followed, and what we are following in my lab. We follow various approaches, and if you go Google my name, we have been in the newspapers, and we have been trying our best to evolve some sort of a strategy. Okay, so uh, basically the symptoms and risk factors are, it ranges from a mild fever to dry cough. So what uh, is like, since it's like a, uh, uh, it's more really like a, a normal cold or flu like infection, but as we know that in more than 80% of infection cases, it's asymptomatic. So it can be like a normal, in uh, flu like uh, symptoms which can be from uh, running noses, nail congestion, sore throat, etc. which are all these are the symptoms of a common cold. But the complications is when in a comorbid uh, uh, patients, who, the patients who are having a like morbid like condition like you have heart diseases, kidney infection, diabetes and other inflammatory diseases in those patient is highly uh, at the risk uh, and many of the complications which are associated with the COVID-19 is basically a pneumonia like symptoms and where uh, the heart becomes like a rubber. So a person is the, he or she faces difficulty in breathing. They have a problem in swelling and recent report that suggests that there are sepsis like conditions in the lungs, uh, this is called as a lung alveolar sacs, uh, air sacs. So that means there is a certain condition of sepsis. So there is a like a blood uh, disruption vessels, like same thing happens in case of dengue fever, where people also have a condition of uh, DHF, that we call a dengue hemorrhagic fever, where there's a vascular leakage and the person, because of internal bleeding, dies. So basically all these are associated uh, in case of COVID-19 we call as a uh, highly inflammation. So lungs is highly infl uh, inflamed and there is a, because of inflammation, there is a vascular leakage and fluid filled air sacs are visible. So as I told you, the morbidity, this mortality in case of COVID-19 is, is really dangerous. It's really high. So I know as an immunologist and a virologist, I will say that it is a threatening condition and we sh all should be careful about this. Okay, So 3.8% on an average is a lot of uh, deaths uh, and uh, we uh, now we are actually seeing explosion in the COVID cases. Okay, So basically 
what, just I will give a general uh, introduction about the coronavirus and etc. So coronaviruses, they are uh, what you call as a, a large envelope posi positive strain viruses. And basically they have been associated from many years and they are known for causing a respiratory gastrointestinal central nervous system diseases in humans and other animals. And they have been posing a human threats, of which you call a public threat. And there have been a, several cases of coronaviruses from like if you think we have a SARS-CoV-1, which was from 2002 to 2003, and they almost uh, 8,000 people were infected and there was a fatality rate of less than approximately 10%. Then similarly, there was uh, another zoonotic uh, coronavirus like uh, epidemics, which you call as MERS, with its respiratory syndrome. And it has infected like more than 1,700 pe uh, people, but with a high fatality rate, like almost 36%. And in 2003, we had a porcelain epidemic diarrhea like uh, coronaviruses, and it has swept throughout the United States, causing almost 100% fat fat uh, fatality rate in piglets, and which wiped out more than 10% of American pig population in a year. So this has been a, a really threat to our human health, not only humans and to animals also. So basically, if you see the classification of coronavirus, coronavirus belongs to a family of coronavirus, and it has a different, uh, you have alpha virus, coronavirus, beta, gamma, etc. And so the SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1 you call, or you can call as a sars cov one and COVID two. So 2019 COVID we call as a COVID uh, 19. Okay, and this belongs to beta coronavirus uh, family. So basically, if you see the structure, uh, the virus is, has a, sp a spike-like uh, structure, and the spike protein of the coronavirus gives the what you call as crown-like structure. So that's why it calls a coronavirus. So the the size of the coronavirus is roughly around 27 to uh, I think uh, 32 kb uh, genome, and basically what happens it is uh, it has a lot of uh, it has a structural proteins and non-structural proteins, and structural proteins predominantly are the spike proteins, and uh, these spike proteins basically attaches to the receptors for the virus entry. And uh, once the virus enters in the tropic cells, okay, so the tropic cells can be a, basically a pneumocytes in the lung. Uh, so one of my collaborators, he is uh, growing uh, coronaviruses uh, in CCMB. Uh, so we have a collaboration for developing uh, antibody-based therapy. So we, we have all this, actually I could not show the visualization how the uh, coronavirus in in vitro condition looks, but just I will uh, I will show, tell you about the structure. Basically, it has a four structure proteins like a spike protein, M protein, hemoglobin esterase, and envelope proteins. So these are uh, they are embedded into a lipid drive from the host cells. And the spike protein or the S protein is the major protein. So today, if you see most of the vaccine de the, uh, developing industries they are only targeting spike proteins because spike spike protein is the protein which is involved in uh, against the neutralization of viruses so if you have a neutralizing antibody against the spike protein we will be able to contain the infection so that, that's how the spike proteins have become a major uh, what you call as a, a source for making a vaccine so i will discuss these things in the later points okay so i don't want to go in detail about the uh, the structures or the genome contents of the virus because of the short in time. So what I will do is just I will give you the um, brief uh, about the what is the structure uh, this S spike protein. So as I told, the spike protein is uh, one of the major immunodominant antigens of the coronavirus, and this is the if you see. 90% of the companies, they are using the spike proteins for making the vaccines or what you call as monoclonal antibodies. So uh, uh, the spike proteins, as I have told you, this is a structured protein. And these proteins play a key role in COVID infection because it binds to the host cell receptors 
and it fuses a with a host membranes and this gain are entry into the tropic cells so uh, this as i told you this recognizes a zinc peptide enzyme which is called as angiotensin converting enzyme or ac2 this is a receptor for the s protein or the corona to gain entry into the target cell so once they gain entry into the target cell they they undergo a what you call as transcriptions and translations they use the host machinery to replicate the virus and therefore they have a uh, they undergo a pathogenesis so basically the s protein as i have told you is a big protein so roughly like 100 kg protein okay and it has a multiple domains so people have shown that the the t- domain which is associated with the binding of the ac ac2 receptor is what we call as a uh, Uh, it is the N terminal, NTD, and CTD. Uh, these are the two domains. They are basically associated with the binding of the binding to the AC uh, AC2 receptors. So, uh, so if we are able to develop a good neutralizing antibodies against this, we will be able to con- uh, contain the virus. So, this is about how the genome of the virus looks like and how it manipulates. So. once the virus gain entry into the tropic cells to the ac2 receptors the basic thing is for, like a, any infection any infection which can be a viral infection once they gain entry the host mounts a series of responses to contain the virus okay and the, to contain the virus there is a high level of inflam- inflammation okay so when you have high level of inflammation because this inflammation is the protective mechanism to clear any sort of viruses so people here have shown that there is a pathway which you call as inflammation so once the virus gain entry into the lung so the alveolar macrophages or the pneumocytes which are the tropic cells start producing uh, gets activated the inflammation gets activated and once the inflammation gets activated there is a high level of what you call as cytokine release so the pro inflammatory cytokines like il beta il6 uh, il18 they are increased so once you have high level of inflammatory cytokines that leads to what you call as a crs syndrome this is called as a cytokine release syndrome so this is also similar to case of a dengue fever so in dengue also we have a, what you call as a cytokine storm Okay, so cytokine storm means when you have a dengue, there is a lot of inflammation, and because of the inflammation, all these what you call as uh, symptoms of pneumonia, the sepsis and uh, clot is because there is an increase in vas- va- vascular like the, uh, this called a vascular leakage, and there is a enhancement in the secretion of various pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines because this is a normal mechanism. Okay, so when you have infection, what happens? Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, many of these cells they give a trigger to the adjoining blood vessels and there is a process what we call as a immune term extravasation so whatever the circulating immune cells they will infiltrate at the site of infection in order to contain the virus so what happens they uh, once they are gone there they start producing lot of cytokines and chemokines and these cytokines and chemokines are basically inflammatory in nature and people have been showing that there are a lot of uh, because of enhanced il18 there is a decrease in antigen presentation decrease in ctl activities and blah blah so so many i don't want to discuss because it will take a long lecture if i start discussing about the basic so in nutshell we have to remember that when you have infection it's because of hyperinflammation which is caused due to the enhanced cytokine storm and this cytokine storms lead to a lot of uh, other secondary uh, phenotypes like you have a enhanced uh, vascular leakage fluid leakage and a, a lot of mucosal secretion as a, a result a person is not able to uh, breathe properly and many of the people die are dying so this is a host response towards covid-19 and to so what are because since it is a basically a immune mediated disorders 
Okay, so there are many of the approaches people have been using and there are a lot of companies which have been targeting wide range of approaches ranging from various antivirals to immunotherapy to vaccines and etc. Okay, so antivirals I don't want to discuss because there are so many antivirals. Recently we have all know about the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine and there are a lot of other HIV drugs people have been testing and people have been using to uh, somehow to contain the virus but still there is no conclusive result as we know that what is the rate of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine so uh, because they are basically also sort of autophagic uh, enhancers so i don't want to discuss about antivirals we will be discussing on the vaccines and monoclonals and various other immunotherapy approaches so what could be the immunotherapic approaches is that people are using various engineering or different approaches to develop our antibodies. So preform antibodies. So we know that there is a concept of what we call as passive immunity. Okay, so we know the transfer of maternal antibodies to the child, and we have been knowing that there are several cases where various horse, like uh, uh, the snake bites or scorpion bites or uh, tetanus, we have been using sort of a preformed antibody. So either raised in animals or either raised in, as a, in the form of monoclonals. So one way of using is either to target the various toxins and antigen of the virus and uh, to contain the, vi uh, the virus infection or to use various monoclonal antibodies to in decrease the level of inflammatory cytokines. So people have been using iron and beta. If you see celecoxic and there are other many today, if you see there, uh, there are array of monoclonal antibodies which are commercially used to treat many of autoimmune disorders or they are used for metabolic diseases. So they have been using uh, monoclonal antibodies against many of the infection diseases. So, <coughs> So monoclonals or antibody therapies has been one of the major today talked about therapies for treating many of the emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So another area, so uh, in the later part of my slide, I will explain to you uh, how antibody engineering can be used for treating, uh, for developing a therapies against uh, COVID-19. And another important we all know is the vaccines. Okay, so vaccine is another arm or which you call arsenals for fight against any infectious diseases. And so vaccines, I will be discussing about what approaches we are following and what approaches other people are, uh, are other industries are developing to make a vaccines against COVID-19 too. But if you, if you see most of the people are using uh, uh, neutralizing, uh, they are trying to enhance neutralizing antibodies against the spike proteins. So spike proteins are the major, what you call a candidate, immunodominant candidate against the vaccine formulation. So I will just talk about vaccines and then we'll go for the antibody therapies. And uh, I will not touch antivirals because that is not my area of specialization. So I'll just uh, try to uh, give, uh, uh, discuss about the various new approaches or modern approaches in vaccinology for containing COVID-19. So we know that the vaccines have been become a part of our life. So as a child is born, we are put with a series of vaccination program. And all this credit goes to uh, this person, which we call as Edward Jenner. So, and this he is credited for the discovery of the vaccines. And uh, apart from that, generally we have a loose postures, and there are other people who have been associated with the uh, the uh, discovery of uh, vaccines. And because of advent of vaccine, we call it as a vaccine as a, one of the greatest strengths of modern medicine. Okay, because with the discovery of vaccine, many of the diseases which were supposed to be uh, what you call as a dreadful, they have been eliminated from human. Uh, what you call as human map. Okay, so <clears throat> now if you see, that's how this cartoon explains. So why a vaccine is important? 
because if there is any epidemics if you know there was a swine flu there was a uh, then you have ebola virus nipah virus so i think we are being challenged with different different type of emerging infections and whenever there is a certain pandemics we just ask the, the biggest question is do you have any vaccine for it or not okay so this is the basic question and then a lot of industries start coming and they start me or uh, making money out of it so today if you see the v- vaccine industry is growing exponentially so this is the the statistics which i'm giving is before uh, corona pandemic but if you see the uh, statistic the growth of uh, uh, the requirement of uh, the vaccine industry has almost 10 or 100 fold increase uh, if, if if we have a successful vaccine so today if you want to become a rich person a day night uh, uh, person uh, you should have a good vaccine candidate and i will just tell you a story about uh, moderna so moderna is a company which is run by a uh, mit uh, mit or stanford professor and uh, uh, he is a scientist and uh, today if you see the moderna which is uh, making a vaccine Uh, which is mrna based vaccine he become a billionaire in a uh, in a in this pandemic situation so what i am saying i am trying to encourage the students so this is uh, one of the career the the vaccine industry or the biotechnology can one be the career for uh, um, for many of the students because not only academically a lot of potential is there for uh, industry point of view so so if you see the chart okay with the discovery of vaccine vaccine has there have been a n number of vaccines today available and as a child is born they are challenged within the two years he or she is pumped with n number of vaccines starting from uh, dtp even the child is not born they are immunized the mother is immunized with so many vaccines so that the maternal antibodies can pass to the, the baby so all the credit go to edward janan and louis pasteur who have discovered this vaccine and this have been able to save 3 million lives every year worldwide so that's how the vaccines have become a, a part of our life okay and it has been so there are various approaches have been used for making a vaccine against different emerging uh, diseases so the one of the if you see the corona vaccine so after the uh, uh, advent of this pathogen many of the industries started into the race and if you see there are more than 19 vaccine candidates which are being developed against covid 2 by ref- by various research teams in companies universities labs who are coming up with different approaches to make different type of vaccine so if we there are at least what we know in china there are at least 37 uh, yeah. oh, sorry so uh, i think uh, yeah mr chintala hello 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 madam dawala could you please respond yeah madam yes, sir. yeah just in between you tell you are able to hear madam yes sir we are able to hear you sir your voice oh, is uh, clear sir it's clear okay actually please interrupt in between actually i don't like a, uh, i i feel uh, is there any technical problem in discussing something if the students have any question they can interrupt me and i can address them okay if they have something yes sir okay so just uh, if you there are 37 com- more than 37 companies and academic group in including 25 in china who are in- involved in various uh, vaccine uh, development programs and there ha- the vaccines have been in different forms so you have a virus based vaccine viral uh, viral vector based vaccine so i will just give you b- brief introduction and then i will jump to our work, research works what we have been doing so uh so this uh, this as i told you the the virus based vaccines can be either a live attenuated which you call as a, a weakened uh, vaccine or it can be a whole killed vaccine and uh, if we have been following in newspapers 
we must be knowing that live alternative viruses, like if you see a company called as Quadagenics, which has tied up with the same institute of India, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there are reports that it's not working against the, the COVID-19 because uh, when uh, they did a trial in the monkey, it was in the challenge experiments. It was not able to provide protection, although it's prevented from pneumonia-like diseases. So, still, we don't have a FDA-approved or uh, good vaccine candidate still. Although people are clear, every newspaper, every day we are hearing something, something, some vaccine formulations are coming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so we have a uh, live alternative. Uh, so there are different approaches, different companies are being using to make a different type of vaccine. And just I will brush up a little bit and then I will go to what we are doing and what we have, will be doing actually. Uh, we have proposed for uh, with, in collaboration with the various companies like uh, Vins Biotech and uh, what we call as uh, <clears throat> biological events. Okay. So uh, this live alternate va uh, virus based vaccines have been used by Codagenex and Serum Institute in India, which is based in Pune. And then we have viral va uh, based vectors, uh, and then you have sub subunit vaccine, which is again based on the spike protein. And then we have what you call as um, uh, the DNA or RNA based vaccines, which you call a mRNA vaccine. Uh, we all know about Moderna, and Moderna is basically used uh, using mRNA technology for making vaccines. And then is a protein based subunit. So protein based subunit means we use a uh, the various heterologous expression system and we use the synthetic genes. We clone into expression system, we purify the antigens, we put into various formulation and we use as a vaccine formulation. Okay, so these protein based vaccines are also a good candidate. And then is a virus like particles which you call as a pseudo viruses. Okay, so pseudo viruses are the what you call as a um, uh, what you call the modern weapon you can call as a pages or you can call as a what you call a f19 or high ranged or arsenal for fighting against the virus so i'll give just a little bit brief how we are so our basically our approach is uh, what you call as a subunit protein based vaccines so basically what happens so the virus vaccines can be of two type i have told is the one is a weakened virus so weakened viruses how they are generated is that they are the viruses uh, which these are the attenuated viruses so they can replicate in the system but they cannot cause the diseases because many of the disease causing factors have been removed so how it is generally developed is you infect into a non-tropic cells and passage into many uh, sort of uh, series of infection and somehow they will lose their tendency. So I will just give uh, somebody ask about herd immunity. Okay, so I will just give you a brief uh, uh, like thing. Like suppose a weak person has to f fight hundred uh, bodybuilders. So what will happen? A weak person at the uh, end of the hundred bodybuilders, he will uh, either become a, uh, he will surrender or he will become very weak. Okay, so this is the concept of which causes a weakened virus or live attenuated viruses. So live attenuated viruses are one of the um, uh, very successful mode of vir uh, uh, vaccination because uh, if you see today, most of the successful vaccine, if you take a yellow fever vaccine, BCG, measles, many of them are a live attenuated or weakened viruses. Okay, and uh, one of the most successful vaccine today ever made is what you call a yellow fever vaccine and yellow fever vaccine is uh, it belongs to the same family of dengue fever okay chikungunya dengue and japanese encephalitis etc okay so that has been one of the most successful vaccines and then one we have is an inactivated vaccine so inactivated means you take the virus complete virus you put into a uh, with a uh, killing agent like you put a formaldehyde or you put a BPL, what you call as a beat up uh, propyl lactone. Okay, so these are the uh, two important fixers. So they once you put, they are killed, and this can be a source of antigen. So these are called as inactivated or killed viruses. So, but the disadvantage, what I have told you, is uh, with a traditional vaccine. So because most of the uh, successful vaccines are live attenuated, but live attenuated vaccines are, have been always a challenge because 
there, there, there are always risk of uh, there is a doubt in our human mind that they can they can gain the virulence and they can uh, become a virulent. Okay, again because they can gain the virulency and many of them there are interesting problems like uh, uh, shipments and transports and delivery etc. So the, the, there is always a challenge associated with the what you call live attenuated vaccines. But kill vaccines also is also a problematic because the kill vaccines they are not able to uh, uh, they require multiple boosters and they terms when you talk about immunology they are not able to activate a lot of uh, memory T cells and B cell responses. So people are trying to take the advantage of because subunit vaccines because uh, you are taking only a component of a virus or pathogen. They are basically very safe, but on the other hand, the disadvantage is that they are weak immunogenic. Okay, so we have to have a different approaches to enhance the immunogenicity, which I'll be discussing in the later slides. What approaches we follow to enhance the efficacy of a if efficacy of a subunit vaccine? But subunit vaccines they have a advantage of what you call as a uh, safety there is no safety cons they, they are better safe and uh, only thing is it required a repeated boosters and acceptors okay so this is the problem so how a subunit vaccine can be it can be a nucleic acid based vaccine so you can use a dna okay so the entire like if, if you are talking about spike protein the spike gene can be cloned into a dna expression vector and then it can be incorporated into the host cell and that can, uh, this, uh, um, uh, once it goes into the nucleus, it can become mRNA and this can make a viral protein and this viral proteins can be taken up by the uh, antigen presenting cells and this antigen presenting cells can present the anti uh, this antigens to the T cells and activate the adaptive arm of immune responses so that we can have both memory T and memory B cell responses. So I don't want to discuss about the vaccine immunology if any student have any problem, they can ask me, uh, okay. So this is how the vaccine immunology works. So antigen is given, they are taken up by the cells, okay. And these cells will make the, the viral proteins and these viral proteins are then exposed to the immune cells in the form of antigen presentation by the APCs and then priming of the T, uh, T cells and naive T cells and B cells to become a memory or B cells. So this can be a DNA vaccine. So, so the spike protein is given in the form of DNA. Another can be RNA vaccine. So you take the RNA component of the spike protein, you put into the proper uh, vesicles, you make into a nano vesicles, which can be a liposomes, etc. and feed the cells. They will be taken up as the antigen presenting cells. They can be presented to the various immune cells and this can be used. So DNA, RNA, and these are the uh, so RNA based vaccine, if you've been heard, hearing, Moderna is uh, doing is a mRNA based vaccine. Okay, so apart from that, there are viral vector based vaccines. And so I'm not going to, so people have been using different engineering approaches, like they are using a um, uh, weakened measles, uh, the backbone of yellow fever vaccine or measles uh, vaccine, and they're trying to incorporate the spike gene into those and they are trying to make it into a vaccine. So these are called as a viral vector based vaccine. Okay, so I am, oh, actually, yeah. So uh, it will take time. Okay, so uh, please be patient. Okay, I'm running short of time. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so another. Uh, Thank you, sir, for your informative session. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let us now no, 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 I am still continuing. Okay, a lot of things are there. I am saying I am running. I will be uh, be delayed. My talk will be delayed. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, yeah. sir. Uh, so let us have some uh, question session, okay. sir. No, but uh, let uh, okay in between because now the second part is still pending. Okay, okay. So if you want to have a question in between. Okay, uh -huh. sir. So uh, I have talked yes, about sir, the viral, yes, uh, uh, viral va vector based vaccine. Now important thing is a protein based vaccine. Okay, so our lab is basically 
interested in protein based vaccines okay so protein based vaccine what we do is we take so i have told you that spike protein is one of the most immune dominant and potential vaccine candidate and every most of the companies are using the spike protein of the corona okay and some of them are also using m protein so there are different way of giving this spike or m protein into the cells okay in the form of vaccine formulation so people use use uh, either the uh, uh, rna of the, uh, the the rna which is coding for the spike protein or they can use for dna coding for the spike protein so they can use a synthetic gene but they have to have a different expression system so i have told talked about the uh, expression system can be uh, heterologous okay so i can express the protein into a hat, uh, either a uh, bacterial using a bacterial expression system which can be e coli or we can have a yeast or we can have a what you call as a baculovirus or human cell okay so basically we are focusing on a protein based vaccine so protein based what we do we take the spike region of the uh, coronavirus which can be a synthetic gene okay we clone into a expression system as as i told you is a e coli or we can use a yeast expression pcr or we can use as a baculovirus expression system we have to always see that many of the viral proteins are heavily glycosylated and in e coli system there uh, this post translation modification does not take place so basically we prefer to use a high expression system either a baculovirus system or we prefer to use a uh, yeast expression system so we, we using this we try to express the spike protein or m protein okay and we purify this protein and put into a various delivery system so one can be a what you call as a, the the making of the spike protein another can be a making of a viral like particles so viral like particles is we call as a pseudo virus so entire membrane entire membrane structure proteins of the virus is uh, uh, they are expressed as a some linkers and they are try to have a virus like uh, particles like means they they mimic like a virus but they are not a virus because they don't have a genetic component etc so this we call as a virus like particle so basically we are focusing on a protein based vaccine which can be a subunit vaccine okay or it can be a virus like particle but the major problem as i told you when you use a subunit vaccine which is a small portion of the virus they are very weak they have a poor memory and t cell b cell responses they require multiple boosters so to solve this problem our lab is focused on three areas okay because what happens if you take a protein and give protein like that there are a lot of proteases in the body which can chop and clear the uh, antigen so we need to put into a proper nanoparticle so our lab is basically focuses on four basic platform so first where we are involved in identification of candidate antigens using various bioinformatics tools and then we try to express this candidate antigen using a various expression system and we have a once we have the purified proteins or antigens in in the case of corona we are as i am talking about the uh, spike protein so once we have the spike protein we need to put into a suitable delivery system so we use a various type of nanoparticles to put the antigen in this because if you put the antigen like that our protease is clear it and there is a weak antigen presentation or delivery okay so we try to put into a nanoparticle we do the uh, biophysical characterization followed by a very immunological characterization so once we have encapsulated the antigen it ha we have made sure because the two uh, in my, uh, so the major challenge with the subunit vaccine is that we should have a proper delivery system and then proper adjuvant system so our lab is basically work in to develop a various vaccine formulation using various nano formulation system and then we are also involved in discovering new type of adjuvants and i will tell you a story where we have recently published a paper in science signaling where we have identified a one of the leading adjuvant that can enhance the memory 
responses and neutralization uh, antibodies production okay so once we have the formulation we immunize in the mice and immunize uh, after immunization we all uh, uh, so uh, uh, yeah so once we have uh, once we immunize in the mice then we go for immunological characterization like we do the um, uh, measurement of the antigen specific b responses and t cell responses and once we have uh, we have identified that okay this candidate is able to enhance the vaccine efficacy by by enhancing the production of neutralizing antibodies or the memory t cell and memory b cell responses we take this uh, for further uh, 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 for further challenge experiment